Chapter 7 Remember me, love, when I'm reborn. George hated the fall. Sapnap had asked him about that once. It was a memory George had to wade through decades to find. Lately, he felt as if he was fighting a losing battle with the past. His memories were submerged in murky waters, and George had to fight tooth and nail to grasp even one. And even when he had it between his hands, he had to hold on with everything he had or else it would just slip away like the rest, disappearing into the vast pit that had grown inside his head. Even now, he held this memory with Sapnap tightly, examining it like a wary jeweler who'd been given fool's gold one too many times. How much of it was real, and how much of it was something else? Or, George thought bitterly, angrily, traitorously, someone else. In the memory, he and Sapnap were alone beneath a tree. In the memory, they were almost happy. George didn't remember how the conversation began, but he knew at some point Sapnap had turned to him and said, I would have thought you'd hate winter most. George had cocked his head to the side, raised an eyebrow in curiosity. What makes you say that? Well, Sapnap began. You know, I figured winter wouldn't be the kindest season for the forest. George considered his words. In those early days, when they were still stumbling around trying to know each other, a lot of Sapnap's questions had made him defensive at best, murderously annoyed at worst. But this one he weighed in his hands with a sincerity that he wasn't used to. I suppose, he said, the difference between winter and fall is the same difference between death and dying. At least with death, with winter, it's all over. There's a certain peace to it, a quiet, but with fall... George shook his head, shaking off a sudden chill. Everything is still on its way. It's all still decaying. Still clinging on, still dying. And that's more agonizing for me. He looked at Sapnap. It was easy, with mortality, to feel like he was saying the same thing over and over across the centuries, explaining himself again and again to every new generation. But now, with Sapnap, everything felt brand new. Death is kinder than dying. Winter is kinder than fall. But you still hate winter, Sapnap said, with a crooked smile. You're absolutely useless in the snow. George winced. Don't remind me. Don't worry, George. Sapnap knocked his shoulder gently against George's. You can leave your winters to me. George couldn't help but return Sapnap's grin. His glee was infectious. It carved dimples into his cheeks and smile lines into the corners of his bright eyes. And the falls, too. Especially the falls. He raised his fists, punching them against some invisible enemy. How young they both were, then, with their whole lives still ahead of them. Give them all to me. I'll take care of you. And George believed him, then. The mortals Sapnap loved died on the first day of fall. George felt it happen. He shouldn't have. It was too far away and the flowers that would have kept vigil over the battle had been trampled by both the season and the unforgiving march of the rivaling armies. But somehow, some way, he still knew. He could feel the grass giving way beneath Sapnap's boots as he was pushed back, and back, and back. He could hear the murmur of the weeds as the bodies began to fall, one after another. Poor little soldiers the prides of their kingdoms reduced to mere fertilizer. For a moment, George allowed himself to think about who they might have been. Sons and daughters and parents and sisters and brothers. Did they believe in the cause they fought for? Or was it a matter of survival, of gold to feed hungry mouths back home? And then the moment passed, because George could almost see Sapnap, a blazing light in the deep dark night. He was fighting, always fighting, his obsidian blade cutting through waves and droves of enemy soldiers, and even those that were his allies. 
George didn't understand, at first. Sapnap was usually so precise, so calculated. Watching him fight used to be like watching a well-rehearsed dance. But this time, he was slashing and clawing and cutting his way through the battlefield with abandon, not caring where his blade landed. And then the watchful trees that curved over the dying soldiers showed George the look in Sapnap's eyes, singular in their focus, frightening in their desperation. He was cutting his way through, his lips moving in a soundless scream, forming names George couldn't make out in the chaos. All at once, George understood. Sapnap was looking for someone, and he was not going to find them in time. The roots of the battlefield, those that remained despite the trampling, whispered the tragedy to him. The war god would not win this war, and he would lose something else tonight, something he held closer to his heart than his own nature. Show me, George begged. Show me where they are. The field obliged. It showed them together, standing together, dying together. They were already broken beyond repair, and still they held each other's hands, a final comfort as their hunter stalked towards them. Even far away from the fight, George felt the cold sting of fear run down his spine. The hunter moved through the battlefield like a ship cutting through the waves, mindless of the tides that pushed and pulled. It knew its way toward its harbor, and it would not be deterred. A trident gleamed in his hand, already slick with blood and gore. He spun it with ease, almost absently, almost like he had all the time in the world. Familiarity dropped into George's gut like a heavy stone. He knew that stance. He knew that arrogance, that proficiency in brutality. He'd been that hunter once. Sapnap too, and Dream. This was their kin. The hunter was a god blank-eyed and vicious. In the end, Sapnap's mortals didn't stand a chance. Right before the trident sunk into his chest, one of them turned to the other, his eyes wide with the despair of someone who knew this to be the end. And finally, finally, there was a hush in the battle, a brief silence that allowed George to hear his final words. Run. Find Sap- George? George blinked, and suddenly he was home. The battlefield faded like a dream, dissolving from his grasp as sugar dissipated into tea water, leaving nothing behind but the sickly sweet aftertaste. The sounds of screaming and blades scraping and blood splattering echoed, once, twice, before fading off into silence. There was no pain here, sitting in the kitchen he'd built and rebuilt again. There was no war. There was only warmth and safety and home. And there was Dream, crouched in front of him to meet his eyes. George. Dream said again, his voice softer than George ever remembered it to be. Come back to me. George blinked, and the rest of the room came back in a blurry focus. He'd been sitting here, alone, restless, since they came back from the war camp, both of them drenched and angry. He remembered putting his fist through a wall. His bruised knuckles, half healed now, was evidence that that memory, at least, was real. He also remembered Dream standing in the doorway, water clinging to his eyelashes like unshed tears, his head cocked to the side, like he was trying to listen to a song playing from the other room. He remembered Dream frowning at his bloody fist, at the crack in the wall, and Dream had said, He'll come back. Just wait. A bitter laugh bubbled out from George then. Waiting. Of course I'll wait. It's all I'm fucking good for. And then he'd marched down to the kitchen, found the closest and only surviving chair, and sat there in the dark. The morning had found him there, and then the next night, too. The days passed him by like he was some insignificant, forgotten thing, and George couldn't muster an ounce of rebellion against the forgetting. 
let the world forget there ever was a god of the forest. Let them all forget his name, that he ever existed long enough to learn to hate, then love, then hate again this strange, wide world where everything felt just a little bit wrong. Let this house crumble down around him and smother him in the ruins of his own making. Maybe he hadn't built a house at all. Maybe, all along, he'd been building his own mausoleum. And future historians will stumble into his own self-made tomb, and they'll find him surrounded by torn-up books and broken chairs and chests of weapons and a mirror with its broken shards painstakingly pieced back together. And maybe they'll conclude, in all their scholarly wisdom, that this dead man had been loved once, loved enough to be given a burial with so many offerings. Maybe. Maybe. They'll even think he was worshipped once. That had been his last, real thought, before the battle called for him. And now, here he was again, alive and breathing, and looking at Dream through a strange haze. Were they underwater? Were they finally drowning? But then Dream reached up, and George flinched back. Both of them stilled, with Dream's fingers inches from George's face, and George knew they were both wondering when George had started being afraid of him. Stay still, Dream said. George did. Dream's knuckles swiped against George's cheek. It wasn't until that moment that George realized he'd been crying. Who are these tears for? Dream asked, knowing George wouldn't deign to give him an answer. Instead, George stood hastily. As he wiped the last of his own tears away, George looked down at Dream, still crouched by his overturned chair, and he said, I guess you were right. He scoffed. When is he not? Sapnap's coming home. But then he didn't. Not for a long while yet. And George waited, and waited, and drowned in his own patient misery. When the door opened, years later, they did not recognize each other. He thought once that would have been an impossibility. They were supposed to know each other, weren't they? To the end of the world? That was the promise. That was the hope that kept him alive the only thing to tide him over as he became a ghost in his own home, haunting empty hallways, pacing empty rooms. But when that front door creaked open, spilling light into a foyer that had not seen the sun in years, it was a stranger who stumbled in. The god of the forests was sitting on the stairs, the slim rectangle of daylight slowly creeping towards him. It slanted over his legs, his chest, his arms, before stopping at the too pale column of his throat, as if even the sun was terrified to reach for his face. Dream, he said, his voice sore with disuse. The stranger didn't respond. Instead, he took one slow step, then another, and then he fell to his knees on the dusty floor and stayed there. Neither of them spoke. Neither of them moved. Neither of them could look the other in the eye. And then there were footsteps coming down the stairs. Dream jostled past him, uncaring, callous, just as he'd been for the past seven years. Dream reached the stranger, stood over him for a long, silent moment. Sapnap, Dream said. And George remembered. Sapnap raised his head from the floor, and the look on his face carved a hole through George's chest. He'd aged. They weren't supposed to. The whole immortal lot of them. They were born and would die as they were. But time had etched itself forcefully into the sharp planes of Sapnap's face. It was a violent senescence, and Sapnap had not put up much of a fight. He'd given in to his own deterioration. Once, it was hard to look at him without seeing the flames of war. Always there burning away in the back of his obsidian eyes, and his mouth was never too far off from a grin. Now, it was hard to imagine this man before George ever smiling at all. His hair grew around a stained face and down his shoulders in a messy tangle, 
His clothes were torn and streaked with what could have been dirt, if George didn't know any better. In Sapnap's eyes, there was nothing. Dream, Sapnap replied, and the word came out in a desperate sob. He reached trembling hands upwards and clutched desperately at Dream's shirt, a god reduced to supplication. I'm sorry. George couldn't see Dream's face, but he could see the way his shoulders tensed. He could only hope to guess at the expression on Dream's face as the green-eyed god reached for Sapnap, taking his muddy, tear-stained face between his clean hands. Just as he'd done for George a million years ago, Dream wiped the tears from Sapnap's cheeks with his thumbs, gently and carefully, with the practiced tenderness of a parent comforting a wayward child. And then, with the same softness, Dream said, Oh, Sapnap, I fucking told you so. George expected Sapnap to flinch back, to fight back, but instead he wilted. Spirit, he choked out. I don't know where he went. I, I lost him, too. I fucking lost him, too. George raced through his memories of the battle, but the poor horse was lost among the carnage. Tell me, Sapnap said. Tell me who it was. I know you know, because you always do. Tell me who to fight. Tell me who took everything away from me. Everything. Finally, finally, Sapnap looked at George. George blinked back at him. He hadn't meant to say anything. He hadn't meant to draw the full, tragic weight of Sapnap's haunted gaze on himself. He had meant to retreat into the darkness not even Dream had managed to coax him out of. But instead, here they were, strangers again, as mistrusting as they were on the night they first met, when George first looked at Sapnap in the flickering light of a bonfire and thought, I knew you once. Sapnap waited for George to finish his sentence. They both knew the words that were in line to follow. Everything. He said he'd lost everything. But I'm still here. But George would take those unspoken words with him to his grave, wherever and whenever that might be. Instead, he swept his eyes over Sapnap, over the white cloak tucked around his shoulders like a child's blanket, over the moss that clung to him almost like an embrace, over the weeds and ivy that had grown around his limbs and the single dandelion stuck to his hair its white petals stark against his pitch-black curls. Sapnap let him look. Still kneeling, still a stranger, Sapnap said. They grew on me, while I was... His eyes darkened, returning to an unspeakable place for a brief moment. While I was... mourning. Was it your doing? George held his shattered stare. No. He lied. Sapnap only nodded. Come on, Dream said gently, pulling Sapnap up. When Sapnap's knees buckled, Dream wrapped his arm around him and let him lean on him. Dream threw George a glance over the top of Sapnap's head. The command behind that single look was clear. Shut up and follow me. Let's get you cleaned up. George pulled himself up from the staircase and watched as Dream led Sapnap back to the kitchen, back to where he belonged, back where George always wanted him to be. But he didn't have it in him to rejoice. He couldn't even muster sick vindication at having been right. There was only the gnawing fear that the worst was only just coming around the corner. Dream and Sapnap's shared footsteps stopped at the doorway to the kitchen. Sapnap? Dream whispered softly, his arms still bracing Sapnap up. He was the only thing keeping Sapnap from crumbling apart, the only one keeping him together. In that moment, all three of them knew he'd already won. Never, he said. <laughs>
his voice turning low and vicious, the warmth bleeding out of his words just as quickly as he'd pretended at it. Try and replace me ever again. Dream helped Sapnap to a chair, watched George place himself across the room, said, I'll be right back, and left George and Sapnap alone together for the last time. For a while, there was nothing to do but wallow in the silence. It settled over them like a heavy blanket, pinning them down against the floorboards of the home they'd built together. Sapnap sat listlessly, curved over himself with his head in his hands, his hair spilling between his fingers in messy tangles. George leaned against the counter, the very same counter he'd had to fix alone after Sapnap broke it in his last fight with Dream, and found he had nothing to say. He used to imagine all the words he'd fling at Sapnap the moment Sapnap crawled back to him, the accusations and the backhanded jibes. Those sharp, practiced words fled from him now, leaving George standing alone, unsure of what to do with his own hands. They'd broken apart before, had had arguments that George thought would spell the end, had walked away himself with no intention of returning. But still, inevitably, like the waves to the shore, they'd come back to each other. This time felt different. This time, the separation felt permanent. The gulf between them was too wide, uncrossable. George was going to cross it anyways. You know, he said slowly, Dream just about lost his mind with you gone. Sapnap didn't look up, but George knew he was listening. I mean, he tried to hide it, but I don't think he expected you to hold out for so long. George drummed his fingers anxiously against the countertop behind him. I think he expected you to come back the moment you lost. The silence stretched. George almost gave up on speaking at all, until Sapnap said, I couldn't leave him there. Well, yeah, but you could have brought them- No, George. Sapnap looked up then, and never had George seen anyone so anguished. I could not leave them there. I couldn't stand up, even if I tried. But I didn't want to try. I wanted to stay there and rot. But a fucking course I couldn't because I'm cursed to live. My punishment is my survival. He took a shaky breath, and George saw him struggle for his next words. You should know, George. I want you to know this. I'll fight Dream's War. I'll fight anyone he tells me to, if only for a chance to put my sword through the son of a bitch that did this to me. And then that's it for me. If George had been anyone else, if he had not lost and lost and lost, if he had not stood in the middle of a forest fire and felt death a thousand times over without dying himself, he would have said anything else but a simple whispered, Okay. Sapnap's mouth twisted into some grim imitation of a smile. Don't worry, he said. I don't expect you to mourn me. A different conversation, from lifetimes ago, echoed around their empty kitchen. Definitely not, George said, which meant, I will do nothing else. Sapnap blinked up at him, and George thought he might have seen a light flicker to life behind his eyes. But it was a candlelight held up against the darkness of the entire universe. It would not be enough. You don't have to go he said. I'll keep my promise to you. This isn't your war to fight. George stared back at him for a long moment. Then he said, Don't be an idiot. He pushed himself away from the counter and walked steadily towards the table. He pulled out a chair, dragged it in front of Sapnap, sat down. If we're going down, we might as well go down together. Dream returned to find George gently plucking leaves and rotten petals from Sapnap's hair, all so fragile they crumbled away in his hands. 
Dream had a half-smile on his face as he stalked towards them, holding a basin of water and a clean cloth. He kneeled by Sapnap's chair, dipped the cloth in water, and began wiping dirt and blood and mud off of Sapnap's face. They moved without saying anything. George stood and walked behind Sapnap to untangle his hair, combing his own fingers through the dark strands as Dream continued his work. They took care of him, and Sapnap repaid them by letting himself be cared for. It wasn't all bad. That was the worst thing about it. Their time together, no matter how it ended, no matter how it started, had moments like this. Moments of tenderness, kindness, brotherhood. George could only speak for his own sincerity, but he would swear until his last breath that it was real for him. And that was what made it hurt. It would be easier to forget a tragedy if he hadn't built a home right at its center. By the time the cicadas started singing outside, the candles were burning low, withered petals scattered across the floor, and Dream had already told them of how they'd start a war. It was simple. It was cruel. Sapnap listened to the plan without saying a word. Well, Dream said, when all was said and laid out before them. What do you think? Sapnap looked to George. But if he hoped to rediscover his morality in the tired lines of George's face, he found cold indifference instead. The writing was on the wall. Virtue would change nothing. Only fools expected honor from gods with nothing left to lose. So Sapnap turned back to Dream. When do we leave? He asked. Dream began to smile. They ended where they started in a world of snow and dead trees and church bells ringing clear through the howling of the north winds. George remembered a town of rickety houses straining against the weight of a blizzard, of narrow gates and narrower roads, of quiet, restrained townsfolk that put all their devotion to the very same god that would plan their demise. But as the three of them crested the hill that overlooked the humble little town, George realized it, too, had changed over the years. Tall walls rose around a large expanse of brick buildings crowded close together, almost like children huddling in the cold. This far above everything, George could see people moving in and out of their homes, or lounging against the freshly lit lampposts, or leaning out of their windows to greet passing neighbors, or heading to the bustling marketplace with baskets tucked under their arms and children tucked under their parents' coats or sitting on the steps of the marble church at the very heart of their doomed city. Everything and everyone looked so small, like ants. It was easier to withhold mercy from insects. The battle axe strapped to George's back seemed to weigh lighter than it ever did. It would be a massacre, plain and simple. Something Dream's Angel could not ignore. Something that would call him back wherever he was straight into the palm of Dream's hand. A whole war, just to draw one god's attention. A small part of George thought they might deserve it. This world, this universe, was rotted down to the core. And here was Dream, letting them burn it down as they wished. Wasn't this what George had wanted all those years ago, when he was standing in the ashes of what used to be his forest? His lungs full of smoke and loathing, his hands itching for a chance at vengeance. This was their fate, and they brought it down on themselves. But then he shook his head, almost like he was clearing cobwebs from it, and all he could hear over the sweet peal of the church bells was the sound of thousands of voices, laughing, talking, whispering, unaware that right outside their city walls, two gods had returned, armed to the teeth. George glanced sideways at Dream, who stood between him and Sapnap. He hadn't brought anything with him, and why would he, when the god of war was the only weapon he would ever need? Distantly, George recalled the last conversation they'd had in the community house. He had wandered the hallways aimlessly, as if, deep down, he knew he would never return there again. He'd placed his hand against the wall, trailing his fingers against the old wood as he walked, 
listening to the creaks of the floorboards under his bare feet. Eventually, inevitably, he found Dream in one of the rooms, standing at the window with his hands in his pockets. The sunset slanted over him, painting his body in scarlet and shadow. In the dying light, Dream almost looked like just a boy, fair-haired and tall and harmless. George didn't wait for him to turn around before he started speaking. You asked me once if you could ever do anything to make me hate you. Dream's shoulders tensed, as if he was expecting a blow, but he still didn't turn. Drawing from the frustration and pain and anger that had gathered in his heart for years, just waiting for a moment to explode, George continued. I can tolerate you being cruel to me. I can bear it. I don't care enough to hate you for that. If I did, I would have left you here alone years ago. He took a sharp breath, feeling like someone had put a knife in his gut and twisted. But he couldn't stop. Not now. Not when he knew it might be the last time he'd ever get the chance. But you tried it with Sapnap, and that's where I draw the line. He's the line, Dream. And you've crossed it. Dream? Sapnap's voice echoed in the cold, dark house. George? I'm ready now, let's go. I'm on my way. George called back, without taking his eyes off Dream's back. Turn around, he begged silently. Look at me and say something for fuck's sake. And he did, but it wasn't something George wanted to hear. Go, Dream said quietly, almost like he hadn't heard George at all. I'll be down in a minute. When he met George and Sapnap at the threshold, he'd said nothing to George. He wouldn't even look at him. Everything since then, all his light-hearted conversations, all his attempts at concern, all his offers of a spare coat when their lonesome trek slowly brought them closer to their northern destination, was reserved for Sapnap, who was Dream's favorite now, who perhaps had always been Dream's favorite, the way he was George's, who had broken the way Dream wanted him to, the way George had not. George felt his icy exclusion down to his bones. With Dream's banishment, and Sapnap's inevitable self-destruction, George was set adrift all on his own, an exile of his own making. He didn't know who he would be after all this. He just knew he would no longer be theirs. Now they stood where the beginning met the end, the axis of all their lives. All the steps they'd ever taken had led them here, standing over a damned city, with nothing holding them together than the faded memory of loyalty. Dream cocked his head to the side as he considered the city stretched out below them. Do you want to know? He said calmly. What kind of god I am, George? George stiffened. It was the first time Dream had said his name since they'd left the house. What? George bit out, because despite everything... Some reprehensible part of him would still answer to the sound of Dream's voice. The merciful kind, he said, throwing George a mirthless grin. Until now. And then he snapped his fingers. That was all it took. A snap of his slender fingers, the movement so quick George wouldn't have registered it if not for the sharp crack that echoed after it, too loud to have just come from a single gesture. It sounded like cannon fire, or the splintering of a giant's bones, or the world ending. All at once, everything stopped. The laughing, and the talking, and the whispering. The walking, and the leaning, and the lounging, and the going about their lives. The noise and activity of an entire city, snuffed out as all the people within it froze where they were, suspended in time, caught mid-step, mid-sentence, mid-laugh. And then, all eyes turned to dream. A thousand heads snapped up, all at the same time, as if they'd been strung on the same puppeteer's string and the puppeteer had pulled. A thousand slack-jawed faces, unblinking, looked to the god that stood high over them. The god whose story was painted on their church walls. The god who now opened his grim mouth and said, Approach. They did.
gods, they did. Hundreds. Thousands. All walking towards their own slaughter. George had thought he was past horror. He was wrong. You. He turned towards Dream, who looked just as surreal as the day they met. You could have done this all along. We never stood a chance. Going against his own sense of self-preservation, he seized the sleeve of Dream's shirt and spun him around, forcing him to face him. That day I let you come with us. That day I let you into our lives. Was that you? Was that you in my head? His voice pitched with hysteria. Dream only fixed him with a look that made him feel so, so small. Would it change anything if I was? You fucking idiot, George said, the word now laced with more vitriol than he thought himself capable of. It would change everything. Dream answered his despair with cool indifference. Then I'll let you believe what you want, George. Preserve what memory of me you want to. See? Don't ever say I was unkind to you. George was swinging his axe before Dream could finish speaking. Dream stepped nimbly back, avoiding the sharp blade by a hair's breadth. He narrowed his eyes at George, in annoyance more than anything. George? He warned. George swung again. Their boots skidded against the snow as they fell into the graceless chaos of one immortal trying to kill the other. There was no logic behind George's movements, no calculated strategy. He swung his axe with everything he had in him, seeing nothing past his own fury. This was a fight he could never win, but he didn't care. He just wanted to make Dream bleed. He could hear Sapnap calling his name from somewhere far away, but his eyes were on Dream. He watched as Dream's face shifted from annoyance, to indignation, to boredom, and then to anger as George kept swinging and swinging and swinging. His axe split the earth where Dream's right foot had been just a split second before, and the sound of it was like the crack of a whip. He was the weakest god of the three of them, but a god he still was. Dream's mistake had been forgetting that. Enough, George, Dream ordered. But George was done listening. Dream stepped back, too slowly, just a second too slowly, and George took his chance. One blow. He only needed one clean blow. He'd cut Dream's heart right out of his chest. George swung for the last time, but Sapnap was there. He slid between Dream and George just as the axe arced towards him. There was the hiss of steel grinding on steel as his sword rose to meet George's axe, and the impact almost knocked him off his feet. With Sapnap still blocking George's strike, Dream stepped casually towards George, wrapped one hand on the axe's bone handle, and tugged it easily out of George's hands, like a parent taking a disobedient child's toy away. George's breath came out of him in short, packing bursts, misting the air between him and Sapnap and Dream. Through the fog, he could see that agonized look on Sapnap's face. He could see Dream weighing his axe in his hands. He could see Dream hold it horizontally, the axe that had been with him almost as long as Sapnap, the axe that had saved his life a thousand times over the decades, the axe that was the first thing that had been well and truly his. Nope, George said, just as Dream brought the axe's handle down over his knee. There was a sharp crack as the axe was split in two, handle and blade, both useless now. Dream tossed the fractured pieces at George's feet with a look of disgust. Look at yourself, Dream spat. Do you really still think you have power over me? You have nothing. Go fuck yourself, George said. Dream's brows knit together. George couldn't read the emotion that crossed his face just then, but only the most generous poet would call it hurt. Dream opened his mouth, doubtless to order him to fall on his own sword, but it was Sapnap who spoke first. George, he said, so quietly the howling winds almost drowned him out. I think you should go. George stood there in the snow, 
miles and miles away from the closest shade of green that wasn't Dream's eyes. Of all the places Sapnap could have broken his heart, did he really have to do it when George was so God's damned powerless? Why? George spat back. So I don't have to watch you slaughter all of those defenseless children? Well, Dream said with a shrug. Not all of them. I still need an army. A mindless army with a pawn for a general, George said, his eyes pinned on Sapnap. How fitting. Sapnap's jaw clenched. After all we know of him, George said, you still choose him. All for a shot at revenge. What do you want me to say, George? Sapnap asked. Exhaustion dripped off every syllable. His eyes were dark with despair. Say you'll come with me. Say it isn't too late. Say you're still my best friend. I have nothing more to say to you, George said. It was the last thing he'd ever say to Sapnap. To dream, to the green-eyed god, to the boy who had ruined his life, George said. I'll see you in hell, I guess. Not if I see you first, Dream replied. So lightly, George almost wondered if he was trying to make him smile. George turned and began to walk away. But then, seven paces in, he turned back around to face them one last time. He could see Sapnap and Dream watching him leave. Behind them, thousands waited in prim and silent lines outside the safety of their city halls the first casualties of the world's bloodiest tantrum, all of their lives reduced to collateral damage, and Sapnap would be the one to deal the death blows. I hope, George said, if there's a life after this, I never have the misfortune of meeting you again. When he walked away this time, he did not look back. He found spirit, lost, but unafraid, in the first forest he checked. Spirit was grazing underneath a wide oak tree, nibbling calmly on the grass until George came forwards out of the underbrush. The horse raised its head, meeting George's eyes, and the forest god raised his hand in greeting. Hey there, he said softly. Sorry to keep you waiting. Spirit blinked lazily. Here. George said, digging into his pockets and taking out a handful of fresh berries. An apology. The horse hesitantly nudged the berries around George's palm before taking a bite, then another, and another until George's hands were clean. For a minute, George let himself lean against Spirit, breathing quietly, in and out, as the forest welcomed him home. The sounds of the cicadas just waking in the dusk, the rush of a distant river, the birds flying high over his head, the leaves rustling in the warm wind, chasing the cold from George's skin. In a few months' time, he'd be burying Sapnap in the valley where they had first met. A week after that, he'd be going to sleep under the very same tree he'd woken up in years and years and lifetimes ago. A hundred years after that, he'd wake again, to find spirit waiting, and he'd manage to smile and say, Hello, do you know what century it is? And when spirit neighed gently in response, George would realize this world, no matter how hard he had tried, would not be worth loving alone. The grief would never leave him, and he'd be haunted by the ghost of unfulfilled promises until the sun swallowed this doomed earth. He would see Sapnap everywhere, in the stars, in every mirror, in every cold river, and he would never stop apologizing. In another story, another life, perhaps they would have fought that last battle together, like brothers, together until their last breath. In that story, maybe Dream would have been with them, just the three of them against the world. In that story, Dream wouldn't be lying when he said he was the best thing that would ever happen to them. But that was a time George hadn't lived just yet. He was still here, in this moment, 
with his head pressed against the warmth of Spirit's muzzle, his fingers still sticky from his offered berries, snow from a distant land still melting in his hair. The forest was alive around him. He grabbed Spirit's reins, still miraculously intact, even after the battle Sapnap had dragged it through. Come on. You must be tired, George said. Let's find you some place to sleep. He led Spirit deeper into the forest, and wherever he stepped, flowers bloomed in his wake. <laughs>